This video is about the causes of evolution. Um, in other words, how is genetic equilibrium disrupted? So this first slide poses a question um, of how giraffes evolved to have such long necks. And scientists actually believe that giraffes evolved from an animal similar to the modern okapi. If you look at the okapi, it has a long neck, but its neck is not nearly as long as the modern giraffe. So how did that happen? Um, we're gonna come back to that question but first I wanna talk about two early evolutionary biologists. Um, the first is Lamarck. And Lamarck had a theory of evolution that had two parts to it. The first part is the theory of use and disuse. And basically the theory of use and disuse was the idea that if you used a part of your body, it would get bigger or stronger. And if you didn't, it would get weaker. So. For example, if you go to the gym and you lift weights a lot, you might get very big muscles. And then if you stop going to the gym, those muscles would shrink. So sometimes the theory of use and disuse are actually true. However, if you stare at a computer screen for a really long time, that doesn't improve your eyesight. So there are some examples where use and disuse actually seems to have some evidence to support it. But the second part of Lamarck's early theory of evolution is where problems arise. He believed that if you acquired a characteristic within your lifetime, you could pass it on to your offspring. This actually doesn't work biologically. So for example, if you go to the gym and get very big and strong, you're not gonna pass on that strength to your offspring. They would also have to go to the gym. They wouldn't be born big and muscular. Um, and so one of the things that people have done is they clip ears of dogs and when the puppies are born in the next generation the ears are not in the new shape that they've been clipped so the theory of inheritance of acquired characteristics was really pretty easy to disprove pretty quickly the next early evolutionary biologist was Charles Darwin and you've probably heard a lot more about him because his theory has um, been supported since then so his idea was that parents had a variety of offspring and that those best suited to their environment would survive and reproduce in greater numbers. So if we were to go back to the question of how giraffes got long necks, Lamarck would say that giraffes were stretching to reach leaves on trees and the higher they had to reach, the longer their necks would get and that their offspring would also inherit long necks. Darwin would have said, that those individuals that had longest necks would have perhaps gotten the most food and therefore, uh, because they could reach more leaves on the tree, would have more food and therefore survive longer and reproduce in greater numbers. And actually, as it turns out, having a long neck, in addition to being able to reach leaves higher on a tree, actually makes you much more able to see um, predators like lions coming. So. Uh, modern biologists actually believe that having a longer neck actually is more of an advantage to being able to avoid predation. So now I want to talk about the causes of evolution, our modern understanding of evolution. But first I want to talk about the variation that Darwin is talking about. Darwin's uh, theory of natural selection has a lot of merit to it. The only issue uh, back then is that Darwin did not know where genetic variation came from. We know now that it comes from mutation, random assortment of homologous chromosomes, crossing over, and random fertilization. So there are some causes of evolution that we're going to be talking about, or, um, and one of them is natural selection, but it would be a mistake to focus only on natural selection because there are other causes of evolution. The first one that we're going to talk about is called non-random mating. And non-random mating is the probability of two organisms mating depending on their phenotypes. So therefore they choose organisms. So for example, lesser snow geese, there are um, grayish blue variety and white and the white geese tend to mate with other white geese and the blue geese tend to mate with other blue geese. So they are choosing certain phenotypes um, and we call that sexual selection. One type of non-random mating is called inbreeding, which is mating between relatives, and it usually occurs in isolated populations. And it's usually disadvantageous because harmful traits can show up if you have homozygous recessive alleles 
uh, being inherited together, and that increases with inbreeding. For example, um, first cousin marriage was very common in the Hopi Indians, and the Hopi Indian tribes had high rates of albinism as a result. And the Royal European families uh, had high incidence of hemophilia due to, due to intermarriages with descendants of Queen Victoria of England. Um, one type of non-random mating, which I mentioned earlier, is called sexual selection, when mating between unrelated individuals has to do with the phenotype. So for example, a female uh, peahen will pick a male peacock with the best feather display. And many um, female birds actually choose their mates based on the bright coloration. You may be hearing the spring peepers um, at this time of year, if it's about April, which is when we usually teach this topic. And the male peepers actually sing to attract mates in groups of three or four, and the loudest male gets to mate with the female. Um, the next cause of evolution that I want to talk about is called genetic drift. And that's when allele frequencies in a small population change due to random events or chance. So this may surprise you, but small populations actually evolve faster than large populations because it is much easier um, to upset genetic equilibrium in a small population. So there are two subcategories of genetic drift that we're gonna talk about. Sometimes genetic drift is just due to something random. So let's say you have a very small population and just by random chance, your tallest individual dies just from some sort of crazy accident then that population would be significantly shorter in terms of the allele frequencies or the genes that cause um, a, tall, a person to be tall. So that's just one example. Another example I want to talk about is called the bottleneck effect, and that's when only a small portion of the original population serves as the sole source of the new population. Sometimes that's because of overhunting. Um, so maybe many of those individuals um, get killed off and there's only a few left to reproduce. And sometimes it can happen when you have a particular species where there is one dominant male who mates with all of the females. And if that happens for multiple generations in a row, that one male is passing on his genes over and over and over in that population. And on one hand, that is a very successful male who has very good genes, but also it leads to a lack of genetic variation which is not good at the species level. Another example is today's worldwide cheetah population. Humans have hunted cheetahs almost to extinction, and the population has rebounded some in terms of numbers, but the genetic variation is still quite low. And if you um, find cheetahs, they are all so genetically closely related to one another that you can take a skin graft from one cheetah to another and they won't reject it. So, you know, they're, it's leading to um, high infant mortality and low birth rate and, you know, inbreeding is happening because the population is pretty small too. The next example that we're gonna talk about is called the founder effect. And that is when a few individuals lead, leave a large population and start a new population. Um, one example of this is actually um, in the Amish country um, in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and about 200 individuals started that population, and there's a genetic disease that is very common there called Ellis Van Creveld syndrome, and there are more cases of this disease in that population than the rest of the world combined. Um, it's an autosomal recessive disorder that leads to dwarfism and polydactyly and a cleft palate, and Scientists have actually traced this disease back to Samuel King and his wife, who um, were part of the original population in 1744. And then, of course, when you have an isolated population where outsiders are not able to come in and join, you end up with inbreeding, which ends up having autosomal recessive or sex-linked recessive um, diseases ending up more common uh, because you don't have as many alleles that might be dominant in the population to mask that recessive allele. Another example 
that changes allele frequencies is migration. Anytime individuals move in or out of a population, alleles are transferred from one population and it changes the allele frequencies in both populations. If you have two populations and you have individuals moving between them, it increases variation in the new population, but it decreases variation between the two populations. And another cause of evolution is mutation. A mutation is any physical change in a gene or a chromosome. For example, a T is now a G, so that would be an example of a point mutation. Um, but any time you have a mutation, you've changed the allele frequency in that population. Now the interesting thing about mutations is that they provide variation, and variation is what drives natural selection. So the last cause of evolution that we're going to talk about is called natural selection. So this is kind of a simplified uh, theory of natural selection, and then we're going to go into a little bit more detail. So first of all, um, variation comes from mutation and genetic recombination, like random assortment of homologous chromosomes and crossing over and random fertilization. But some variations are helpful, some are harmful, and some really make no difference at all. But nature selects those individuals with beneficial variations, which we call adaptations, to survive and reproduce. An adaptation is any inherited trait that helps an organism survive and or reproduce. It's very important to understand that individuals don't adapt, at least biologically speaking. Populations adapt, and an individual may have an adaptation Okay, that they have inherited. And then over many generations, the population changes, and this is evolution. So natural selection isn't the only cause of evolution, it's just the most interesting one. So anytime you have these adaptations building up in a population, you're gonna have allele frequencies changing. So now let's, let's go into a little bit more detail about natural selection. So, First of all, Darwin noticed when he was making all of his voyages all over the world that most species produce more offspring than are necessary to maintain the population, and in fact, more than can probably survive due to limited resources. Um, as he, there are some examples of this actually in the Galapagos Island with uh, blue-footed boobies, um, and the females always lay two eggs, and when the eggs hatch, the bigger sibling will push the other one out of the nest. And there are very, very limited resources in that particular location, and the female can't really feed herself and two offspring. And in fact, they found that any female that attempted to uh, feed both offspring was less likely herself to survive and be able to produce offspring in future generations. And that is sort of leading to what I was talking about, about competition for resources. If you've got overproduction, it's going to lead to competition for resources. Um, sometimes competition for resources might mean for food, water, or shelter, but it also might mean competition for mates. Now, due to mutation, there's going to be variation in a population. New traits come only from variation, but you can get new combination of traits together due to random assortment of homologous chromosomes, random fertilization, and crossing over. So, due to variation, some individuals are going to be better able to survive and reproduce in a particular location. So, an adaptation, whether something is an adaptation, really depends on the environment. So, for example, if an organism had a mutation that made it have white fur, that might be helpful in an, a climate that's very snowy and may be harmful in a jungle population. So it would be an adaptation for an organism that lived in a northern climate but not near the equator. So an adaptation is any inherited trait that improves an organism's chance of survival and reproduction. In order for evolution to occur, the organism has to survive, but it also has to reproduce and pass down those traits. So, 
Natural selection is when individuals with variations that make them better adapted to their environment survive and reproduce in greater numbers than those without those traits. So in other words, mutation is the raw material for natural selection because without mutation, you don't have variation. And without variation, there can't be certain traits that help you survive or reproduce. Over many generations, favorable adaptations may accumulate in the population and unfavorable traits disappear. And eventually the changes are so great that the net result could be a new species. We're gonna be talking about speciation in more detail in a future lecture. And the last topic I wanna to talk about is fitness. You may hear the term survival of the fittest, but fitness is not the idea that only the strong survive. Sometimes you'll be watching a nature show and some big predator will um, catch prey and they'll go, oh, that's survival of the fittest. But fitness is a much more specific idea than that. Fitness is reproductive success. So just because you are a great hunter doesn't mean you have great fitness. It might lead to that if you're able to produce food for your offspring in greater numbers, but fitness is reproductive success. It's the number of offspring an individual produces that survive to reproduce, and it's relative compared to others in the population. So for example, um, if a human had 10 offspring, that would be relatively high fitness, but it might not be high fitness for bees per se. So it really has to do with what proportion of the next generation is related to you. So fitness is reproductive success, not necessarily how well adapted you are to your environment, although there is a link between the two.